It's a Wednesday edition of the hiatus version of the PFT Live, PFT PM podcast. One day away from a removal of my vampire rogue wisdom tooth. It'll probably be a while until you see me again, assuming that all goes well. Even if all goes well, I'll be swollen tomorrow and I probably won't do it. Also, I'll be still under the influence of some sort of medication, although again, won't be much less of a quality of product than you're accustomed to. Either way, I'll probably be back by Monday and we'll we'll do it then. But we've got plenty to do now before we get to the point where I have my jaw cut open and an impacted tooth forcibly removed with power tools. Let's get to, you can tell I'm really looking forward to this. The Saints have signed tackle Ryan Ramchek to a long-term deal, and we know the drill by now. And first of all, th this is the prime time to work out extensions. Everything has slowed down. Everyone is removed from the fray. People really aren't taking full-blown vacations yet. Take care of some business. Get some contracts negotiated. Make sure the guy has full security before he shows up for training camp when he puts himself at risk again. So Ramchick's deal, highest paid right tackle in league history. Of course, that's what the agent told the people that broke the story. And it very well may be true, but I like to wait for the numbers to, to really get a feel for how good or not a deal may be. I remember two years ago, Xavier Howard's contract, highest paid corner in league history. Well, when you broke it down, it really wasn't that great of a deal. And in the two years since then, Xavier Howard has come to that conclusion himself. So we'll see what the real numbers are on Ryan Ramchick. But bottom line is, whatever the Saints offered, he accepted certainty, security, and the Saints have one of their best players under contract for years to come as they transition to life after Drew Brees and the all-important question of who will be the starting quarterback week one and beyond. Will it be Jameis Winston? Will it be Taysom Hill? One of the things to be figured out during camp, one of the things to not be figured out during camp, will there be an extension with Ryan Ramchick? One of the big questions early in the offseason was the Dak Prescott contract. Obviously, he got it done, and he got a massive deal, a better deal, frankly, than Patrick Mahomes, although Patrick Mahomes' deal is worth a half billion. It's a deal that lasts 11 or 12 total years from when it was signed. Dak Prescott got an excellent contract, a four-year deal that, as a practical matter, will be renegotiated after three, or he could walk away as a free agent. He walked away from the question of whether or not he's been vaccinated. And I understand this is a very political issue. I understand that somehow this has become the latest thing on which we are divided on as a people. But I need to say this again. As it relates to the question of whether or not it's anyone's business, whether or not an NFL player has or hasn't been vaccinated, this is a different job than pretty much any other job in the country. Because already, when you sign up to play in the NFL, your health is an open book. Every week, if you're injured in any way, it gets disclosed. If you have an illness, it gets disclosed. If you've got tonsillitis, it gets disclosed. If you've got appendicitis, it gets disclosed. There are no health secrets because your availability as a football player is a critical piece of information, especially as legalized gambling continues to spread throughout the country. So if a player isn't vaccinated and therefore susceptible to the possibility of a sudden finding on any given day, and he will be tested every given day for COVID-19. Any one test, Sunday morning, game day, you're positive, you're not playing. Whereas for the players who are vaccinated, as we reported at PFT a week or two ago, you only get tested once every two weeks. That's it. So which guys are going to be the ones who are at risk of finding out on the day before a game or the day of a game that they can't play? It's the players who aren't vaccinated. It's fair game to have that information available. It's another factor to be considered. Now, look, how much risk do you assign to the possibility that Dak Prescott all of a sudden won't be able to play on a given Sunday? I don't know, but it's just another factor that goes into the analysis. It's another thing about which players and teams in the league need to be transparent. So, look, I, I get it. And... I've made this point before, and of course, it gets a lot of people triggered. Folks who otherwise could give two craps about the rights of players all of a sudden are supporting 
the right of a player to not say whether or not he's been vaccinated. This is different. This is unique. This is the NFL where your health is an open book. And it's fair to ask, and it should be expected, that the player will answer whether or not he has been vaccinated. And frankly, take it out of the player's hands. It's information that the team should make available. It's the information the league should insist on teams making available so that people who are wagering their hard-earned money on a given football game will know whether or not there's a chance the morning of the game the starting quarterback isn't going to be able to play directly because he chose not to be vaccinated. I'm getting a phone call, and now I'm not getting a phone call. I have to call that person back. Sorry about that. All right, let's move on to the next topic. Tom Brady, speaking of vaccination, I, and this is something Sims has said. I haven't written this yet at PFT because it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to reduce it to a written story and then let the trolls have at it. But Sims and I discussed it within the past couple of weeks, maybe once or twice. I think on the air, there's a chance we talked about it during the break, but what the hell. Sims is convinced there's no way Tom Brady is vaccinated. Because Sims says Brady won't even use sunscreen. He doesn't want any chemicals touching his body, directly or indirectly, inside or outside. So he's not going to want the vaccine. And he's going to think he's impervious to COVID. Remember last year? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I'll be interested to see if anyone doesn't fear asking Tom Brady the question. There's a lot of, there's a lot of questions out there that we have for Tom Brady. It starts with, are you vaccinated? Will someone ask him that at training camp? It continues to, who is the mother bleeper to whom you were referring when you appeared on HBO's The Shop Uninterrupted? And third, why are you endorsing Subway? That, that's been the big story over the course of the last day. And it's amazing to me. And I try not to, I, I try not to give credence to the reactions that people have on social media. I pay attention just out of curiosity, and sometimes it's entertaining and it's fun for me to engage in the banter. But it, it, it really is strange that people get angry when you point out hypocrisy like Tom Brady would never go to a Subway. Tom Brady would never eat Subway food. And, and I understand when he was in college, he did. But this isn't Tom Brady in 1999. This is Tom Brady now. Tom Brady now will not eat Subway. Tom Brady now will not feed Subway to his family. Tom Brady, to coin or to borrow from Randy Moss's phrase, would not feed that bleepity bleep to his dog. But Tom Brady's collecting a check from Subway. Is it not hypocritical? It's fascinating to me. And I think it's possible to believe, as I do, that Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time arguably the greatest player of all time at any position when you consider the tangibles and intangibles in the history of the league. But he's also a hypocrite, clearly a hypocrite. Read the TB12 method, got a copy of it, got a signed copy of it, personalized signed copy of it. And I flipped through it yesterday. Chapter eight, nutrition. I quoted some of it at PFT. Clearly, Subway products, Frito-Lay, another company for which... Brady appeared in a TV commercial. We need potato chips. Not on a regular basis, sparingly, hardly at all. Not food is how he would describe chips and Subway. And we know not that long ago, he applauded Ronaldo for dissing Coke products at whatever tournament was going on. And uh, yeah, they sell Coke at Subway as well. So, I, hey, I, I'm not going to begrudge anyone the ability to go make a living. That's fine. Go, go make as much money as you can. He's already got more money than he's ever going to need. If you got a way to make more just by lending your name to a product, so be it. But it's fair for us in the media or anyone else to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait a minute. Tom, the last guy, if you were making a list of the guys least likely in the world of sports to have a deal with Frito-Lay and Subway, it would be Tom Brady least likely. And there he is. I got no problem with it. Go get paid, Tom. But man, a sucker really is born every minute. And there are going to be people out there who, who maybe don't follow the sport as closely as the rest of us do. And if you're watching this, that means you follow the sport closely. We know Tom Brady ain't eating no Subway. We know 
Tom Brady ain't eating no Doritos. We know, but he's also getting paid to directly or indirectly create the impression that he does. Devontae Adams continues to be in the news. There were some comments recently from Raiders quarterback Derek Carr, who was a teammate of Adams at Fresno State. Carr would very much like to reunite with Devontae Adams. It's okay for a player to say. It's not tampering. Now, if Raiders management went to Derek Carr and said, go say this, then it's tampering. But players can say whatever they want, directly, indirectly, publicly, privately, however they want to do it. I think I've now said directly, indirectly three times, make it four during this special hiatus edition of PFT Live slash PFT PM. But nevertheless, Carr would like to play with Adams. Adams has said he'd like to play with Carr. The question is what happens with the Packers contract and more importantly, what happens with the quarterback situation in Green Bay? It's going to be a strange year for Devontae Adams if Aaron Rodgers isn't there because if Jordan Love just doesn't click, if it doesn't work, it's going to hurt Devontae Adams' numbers may make it harder for him to get the kind of contract he's looking for next year in free agency. If Rodgers is there, could be a big year for Adams again. Adams could walk away next year. And, you know, if we talk about the possibility of Adams playing for the Raiders, it may not be a reunion with Derek Carr in Las Vegas. Maybe a reunion with Aaron Rodgers in Las Vegas. Because... If Rodgers isn't playing next year, and I think he will be, I don't think he's getting traded this year. I think he's going to show up and play, and I think he's going to get traded next year. If the Broncos are at the table to try to get Aaron Rodgers, the Raiders have to be there too because you'd rather, much rather, have Rodgers on your team than have Rodgers on the Broncos. So maybe it will be Adams as a Raider, and maybe it'll be Adams catching passes from Aaron Rodgers. Other news from the AFC West, the surprising revelation from Tuesday night that a lawsuit filed by a couple of Pat Boland's children challenging the authority of the trustees that have been running the franchise for nearly a decade now, that trial was due to begin in that lawsuit on July 12th. All of a sudden, stayed and vacated is the trial. Doesn't mean the case is over, just means the parties jointly decided to ask the judge to press pause on the case. Now, that only happens when, uh, un un unless both sides just realize, holy crap, how are we going to get ready for this trial? There isn't enough time for us to get ready. We need a continuance. But that's what it would be, a joint motion for a continuance. When you vacate the trial date and stay the proceedings, that means that there's a resolution that's being discussed. Now, no one connected to the Broncos is saying anything publicly or privately on the record, off the record about anything that's happening. But I think there's two explanations. One, maybe they're just going to throw their hands in the air and realize there's no way that this ultimate goal of Pat Boland is ever going to be fulfilled, whereby one member of his family, one of his seven children, appointed by the trustee to take over the team because, as Joe Ellis, one of the trustees, and a longtime Broncos executive has said they all have to be on board with it. And if you've got a couple of them, and, and this is one of those issues where you've got some kids from a first marriage and some kids from a second marriage and they don't always see eye to eye. So the two children from the first marriage are opposed to the idea of Brittany Bolin, one of the five children of the second marriage running the team. If those two are never going to agree, then at some point you just got to throw your hands up in the air and say, we just got to sell the thing. And that may be what they're deciding to do. Let's just sell it to the highest bidder. Let's get as much as we can. Let's max out whatever revenue we can generate in this new world of legalized gambling where some in ownership believe that teams soon will be worth eight to, eight to 10 billion. Just the average random team, eight to 10 billion. Not the great teams, not the Cowboys, not the Raiders who are smack dab in the middle of Las Vegas, but the average random team, eight to 10 billion. So maybe that's what they'll do. The other possibility... And this is what happened with the Titans very quietly. No one really paid much attention to this. But when Bud Adams died, his estate split the team up into three parts to go with the three branches of his, of his family tree, his three children's families. But he never put anyone in charge. And that was an issue that lingered for years. What was going to happen? The league wasn't happy with it. The Titans weren't happy with the pressure that the league was putting on the Titans. But eventually, Roger Goodell got involved and, and brokered a deal where one of the three children said, I'll cash out. You buy me out and I'm out. 
So now it's two of the remaining families that are running the team. That may be what happens here. You could have the five children of the second Pat Boland marriage buying out the two that brought the lawsuit against the trustees and, the, and, and those two just move on and the five take over the team and Brittany Boland ultimately runs the team. That could be the possible resolution as well. But something's going on with the Denver Broncos and they need an owner. Every team needs an owner. The Packers are the only team that will never have an owner because it will never be anything but a corporation. But the teams that aren't incorporated need someone, one person who can make decisions, who has the power to swoop in and do what needs to be done. The league requires that. They want one person who has the authority to make big decisions. And yes, the Packers have that one person, but that person doesn't act with the same confidence or lack of accountability that an owner does. And, and there are good things and bad things about it, but every team that isn't the Packers needs someone like that. All right, I need to answer some of your questions. And uh, let's see what we got here. Our good friend Tom Marshall, otherwise known as at a Red Zone Elk, is Deshaun Watson under any pressure to settle his case and force the NFL to declare any punishment before training camp? We talked about this a little bit yesterday. And let me just summarize very briefly because I wanted to answer Tom's question because I, 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 in my mind, it's very basic. There's value in settling the case. Case says 22 of them. There's value in getting them settled before the start of training camp because then Deshaun Watson would not be put on paid leave, presuming that along the way the criminal investigation is closed. And if those 22 cases are settled, they would be because part of the process, I think, will be now you can't you can't get the 22 individuals to agree to refuse to cooperate if they're subpoenaed by a grand jury or subpoenaed to testify in a criminal action. But if the 22 individuals believe they've gotten justice through the civil justice system, it's a lot harder to prove anything beyond a reasonable doubt in criminal court. So if that happens, then no paid leave. Deshaun Watson goes back to the Texans or gets traded. I think that would be the more likely outcome. And the only question then is when and if and how many games he would be suspended for as his substantive punishment for this incident under the Ben Roethlisberger precedent from 11 years ago when he had two allegations, two. One was a civil lawsuit. One was potentially a criminal case that didn't result in a prosecution that I still believe resulted in some sort of a settlement. And even then, Roethlisberger was suspended six games reduced to four. So I thought this was going to be a short answer. Sorry, it's not. Yes, there's a good reason to settle the case before training camp because then I believe Deshaun Watson would be traded to another team. Broncos, Dolphins, Eagles, the three leading possibilities in my mind. But if he doesn't settle, that's when it's incumbent on the league to let everyone know, not publicly, just privately, the Texans, the teams that may want to trade for him, Watson's camp, whether or not he's going to be put on paid leave so he can make a decision. And the teams involved can make their decisions about what they're going to do. Because I still think it's hard to justify putting him on paid leave. Now, the league's got the discretion to do it. And I think they have the obligation to make a decision about it before camp opens and to make sure that everyone involved knows. So uh, long story bearable, that's my answer. So it isn't critical that there be a settlement, but uh, – Either way, there needs to be some clarity about whether or not Deshaun Watson is going to be available when camp rolls around. PFT, PM Posse, what major NFL news is most likely to break during the slow time? Contracts, trades, quarterback power plays. Well, the contracts. We already saw Ryan Ramchick today. We're waiting for, and I think the order is going to be Lamar Jackson, then Baker Mayfield, then Josh Allen. I really do think that's the way that it'll unfold. And I think the two quarterbacks from the 2018 first round draft class who have agents are waiting for Lamar Jackson to go first because if either of them go first, then Lamar Jackson, who doesn't have an agent uses the Mayfield or the Allen contract as the starting point for his own. And if Jackson ends up getting a better deal than one of the quarterbacks who have traditional agents, that's not a good look for the traditional agents. So I think other contracts potentially will be done. The goal is to get players financial security, protection against injury before they show up for training camp. And look, the power plays, I think are, are over, but for Aaron Rodgers, and we don't know what power play he's going to make. I still think he's going to ultimately show up. PFT PM Posse, what are your thoughts on the great A&E documentary on KISS? Did you watch it while wearing 
the jersey. The jersey is framed. That was a couple of years ago that the PFT PM Posse sent me for Christmas, I believe it was, a signed by Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons jersey of the defunct LA Kiss from the defunct Arena Football League. I I never know what is going to be available to stream on the A&E website. I've tried to watch some of the WWE biographies, some I was able to watch, some I wasn't. I've got YouTube TV, a and E's not on there. It's not one of my providers. And I, I just, I checked earlier today to see if I could watch the Kiss documentary and it's there. And I've watched most of the first episode. It's stuff I've already known. It's repackaged. There's some footage that maybe I hadn't seen before. There's maybe a way that Gene Simmons or Paul Stanley tells the story that I haven't heard. But, but I, I've known it all. It's a refresher course because it's something I've been aware of. I've read the autobiographies of Paul Stanley, of Gene Simmons, of Peter Chris. I don't know if Ace Frehley wrote one. I'm not even sure he can write. But uh, I, I know the whole story of Kiss. I could probably recite it if someone asked me uh, to do it. And especially now after I've had my memory refreshed by watching a lot of the first part of the documentary. But yeah, it's good. And if you don't know anything about Kiss, I, I think you learn a hell of a lot. And, and it's all in one place. And uh, it's entertaining. It's well done. Uh, but but it really isn't anything new to me. All right, Dilip Rao. If the Broncos cannot land Aaron Rodgers, is their offseason a colossal bust? Their roster leads one to believe with adequate to good quarterback play they'd contend, but they cannot muster such with the room that they have. I still believe in Teddy Bridgewater. And Teddy Bridgewater is reunited with Pat Shermer, who was the offense coordinator in Minnesota. Bridgewater didn't play much quarterback, if any. I think he had some cameo duty during the 2017 season when Shermer was the offensive coordinator. But uh, I, I, I think that uh, Bridgewater may be the best option, the most consistent option, and their defense is still pretty good. They've got some weapons offensively. I don't know if the offseason is a colossal bust if they don't get Aaron Rodgers. And if they get Aaron Rodgers next year, people will forget about this year. But look, it's been a drought for Denver. They won a Super Bowl now six years ago, haven't been back to the playoffs since then. And, and that, that's not a usual occurrence for the Broncos. They've been one of the consistent contenders for years. They've, they, they're in the middle of, and from their perspective, I, I'm sure they would say they hope they're at the end of, a dry spell that, that they hadn't had really since the merger in 1970. So they need to find a way past this, and quarterback has been the issue. But uh, the Packers don't want to trade Aaron Rodgers. And unless Rodgers can work some magic and get the Packers to change their mind, then Rodgers won't be a Bronco until 2022 at the earliest. Let's see what else we have here. I was interested in this question from Dilip Rao. He asked several today, and I appreciate his input. What is the single greatest talent a quarterback should have coming from college? Monster arm, accuracy, a fast visually processing mind, a work ethic. I, I think that, and, and this comes from spending the last four years working with Sims, I think the monster arm and the accuracy would kind of be hand in hand. I'd say a monster arm is 1A and accuracy is 1B and everything else can be worked with. But if you have a big arm and if you've got that quick release and if you've got the ability to, to get the ball delivered with velocity and force from multiple body positions and multiple arm angles, that's the most powerful trait you can have. That's the Mahomes skill. That's the Aaron Rodgers skill. Flick of the wrist and the ball's 50 yards down the field. So a monster arm that doesn't need to be cranked up like a catapult, that can be unleashed with a flick of the wrist. I'd say that's the most, the most desirable trait. But you also have to be accurate. What's the point in having a big arm if it's only coincidental if the football lands at its intended target? All right, let's see what else we have here. Try to answer a couple more, but I've been going here for about a half hour. So let's try to wrap this up. Question from Burn Unit. Can NFL owners transfer the team or sell it to their children for $1 before they pass away to avoid the death tax? It's not that simple. There are legitimate ways to move around equity to avoid a situation where an owner dies, the family can't afford to pay the estate tax without selling part or all of the team. And, and I think that, as I mentioned yesterday, is one of the reasons why we saw what we, we saw in Washington with Tanya Snyder now being a co-CEO and co-owner. That's potentially one of the reasons. Other teams are going to have that problem as the value of teams go up and up and up. 
when the owner dies, the person holding the bulk of the equity, somebody's going to have to pay that estate tax. And uh, I, it's, it's not nearly as simple as transferring all of your holdings to a child for a dollar, you know, a minute before your life ends. Preston Woods, if the Seahawks have a disappointing season, more likely that Russell Wilson is traded or Pete Carroll is forced to retire due to pressure from Wilson on the organization, him or me type of a deal. I've been fascinated by that possibility. And I don't know that Wilson would ever say him or me, but if Wilson bangs the drum like he did earlier this offseason, if things don't work this year with Shane Waldron, if Pete Carroll won't let them work the way that Waldron wants them to work offensively, and Wilson still insists on getting out, could that prompt the Seahawks to make a change? And, hey, I, I say all the time, when you're hiring a coach, you probably should hire an offensive guy instead of a defensive guy because if you hire a defensive guy and he hires a great offensive coordinator and that coordinator does a great job, he's getting hired somewhere else as a head coach. And then what do you do? So it could be a win-lose for the Seahawks this year. If that offense is great with Russell Wilson, and they get to where they want to be, and Wilson's happy, and then Shane Waldron becomes a head coach somewhere else, you're right back in the same spot you were in this year. So, and Carroll got the job before that concern really crystallized that, you know, the defensive coach with the great offensive coordinator much more likely to lose his top lieutenant than the great offensive coordinator who's got a good defensive coordinator, and it feels easier to, to replace that guy because the offense is the thing that drives the bus. But it's something to keep an eye on. I doubt that Russell Wilson would ever make it him or me. But if he keeps making it known privately, if they keep agitating for a potential trade, it could be that ownership eventually decides, we got to choose one of these two guys. And maybe we'll choose the guy that's going to be around into his 40s playing quarterback than the guy who's on the brink of 70 as a head coach. All right, let's see what else we got. John Ramos, which head coach do you think is going to be the first to be fired this season or any currently on the hot seat? Yeah, look, I, I, I think that, that uh, the hot seat this year consists of Cliff Kingsbury, the Cardinals coach. And you know what? I hate to put this flag on him, but we got to put it on somebody. You know, if they come out of the gates one and five, two and six, if they fall out of contention quickly, I wouldn't be surprised. The Cardinals run through coaches pretty regularly. No one has coached that team for more than six seasons, and that team has been around more than 100 years. I think if they don't make it to the playoffs this year, Clint King Kingsbury is going to be out. It isn't a prevailing thought, but I think by the time we get to the start of the season, it will be. And, and what have we heard recently from the Cardinals? Steve Kime, the GM, we got to make the most of Kyler Murray while he's on his rookie contract. Christian Kirk, it's now or never. Kyler Murray, I don't want to get used to this feeling of not going to the playoffs. I think it's the next logical step in Kyler Murray's career. If Kingsbury can't get to the team to the playoffs this year, I think there will be a new coach. Someone handpicked to come in, get the most out of Kyler Murray, and get the Cardinals to the playoffs in a very difficult division. I don't think Matt Nagy's on the hot seat. I think that was part of the, the decision that was made, the broad overall multi-year decision made when they traded up to get Justin Fields. Some would say Mike McCarthy's on the hot seat. I don't see that, especially not a guy that would be fired during the season. Um, I, at this stage of the year, look, we know, we know there are going to be coaches whose teams come out of the gates struggling. Uh, maybe someone to be 0-4, 0-5, 0-6. But I I look, I, I I don't I don't know. There isn't one that's really jumping off the page other than Kingsbury. Now I think it's a big year for Mike Zimmer. I don't think he'd be fired during the season, but if the Vikings don't make it to the playoffs, I mean, I think they'll be in the conversation. They're in the conversation every year. They're in the fringe of the playoff talk every year on the odd number of years they get it, on the even number of years they don't. If they don't make it this year, I think Zimmer could have a problem, but not during the season. If one guy, in my mind, is going to go during the season, I think it's going to be Cliff Kingsbury. And it would, it would require the Cardinals starting this year the way they finished last year. And remember, after the Hale-Murray play, when they beat Buffalo in that, that great game, November-ish, 2-5 and five after that. They start off like that. They could have an interim coach at some point 
during the season. One more question from eh, maybe a couple more NFL leads. Will you be doing an audiobook version of Playmakers? I think that's on the docket. I think so. For those of you who, for whatever reason, can manage to listen to the sound of my voice, you'll get the chance to do it for about 300 pages if you choose the audiobook option. But remember, Playmakers is coming out March 15th. And we will, hopefully by the start of the season, have the pre-order function up and running, available, and we'll be marketing and promoting the book heavily throughout the 2021 season, culminating in the release on March 15, ideally with an audiobook option. Although, it's one thing for me to say, sure, there will be one. It's another thing for me to pick up a 300-page book and read every damn word of it. I have to renegotiate my contract. Uh, okay, one more. Hawkins, what is your favorite Michael Scott moment? I, the, and I, I, I'm taking this one because there's a great book that I just finished. The Untold Story of the Office, Oral History of the Office. Can't remember the exact title, and I can tell you the title right here because I've got it in my little, uh, my little electronic library. Of course, now that I say that, I can't get to it. Library, here it is. The Office, the untold story of the greatest sitcom of the 2000s. I just finished it, and it was great. Picked up so many details that I wasn't aware of. Some of them blew me away. No spoilers here. Go read the book. Uh, I, I, my, my favorite moment in the show comes from Creed. It's when someone had pooped on Michael Scott's carpet, and Creed walks up and says, hey, guys, somebody making soup. That, to me, is... <laughs> That I, Sorry, but that's the best moment in the entire series, in a series full of plenty of great moments. The best Michael Scott moment, um, yeah, I, I liked his appearance in the finale, and you'll learn about how they kept that under wraps if you read the book. I don't know why I'm promoting and marketing that book. They ain't paying me to, and I didn't get a free copy, but it is a great book if you want to read something this summer. I think any of the moments where Michael Scott went from being a jerk into being a human being, and one one of the moments where they first humanized him was at the end of the Office Olympics episode where they, they give him one of the fake medals, one of the yogurt lids, and they play the national anthem and he tears up. That's like the first moment that he pivoted from just this kind of a butthole to a guy who was just kind of a goofy, misguided, not self-aware, ultimately and profoundly human being who could grow and develop and be sympathetic. So plenty of great Michael Scott moments, but, but they started to work in more of those moments where you find yourself saying, you know what, I, I really want the best for this guy. And you feel ownership of him, even though he could be very objectionable a lot of the time. I resemble that remark. Let's call it a day at that. Thanks for some of your time. Please wish me well on Twitter or elsewhere for tomorrow's removal of my vampire rogue wisdom tooth. There's an outside chance. I'll be back Friday. I'm pretty stubborn. I may be swollen up like a chipmunk, but I may be back on Friday. I can do it. I can do the profile uh, if need be to, to disguise my grotesquely deformed face. Otherwise, here's hoping we can do it on Monday. If we don't talk before Monday, be safe and smart. Fourth of July weekend, emerge with all fingers and toes, please. Don't drive drunk. Don't shoot off fireworks drunk and pay attention to the warning label on every piece of fireworks that you'll come across, light fuse, and get away. That's it. See you next time. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.